Alright folks, in this video we're going to look at the diagnostic features of minerals and this is going to be an important video to, to watch before you, you do the lab on mineral identification here, right? To look at these diagnostic features. Now I'll also be showing you some of these in the lab setting, uh, but for right now I just kind of want to talk about the different diagnostic features, right? So first of all, diagnostic property number one, crystal form. This is going to be the external expression of the arrangements of the atoms inside. So we see this beautiful piece of fluorite here, this fluorite here, right? These are, are um, the crystal forms of this, right? This dodecahedron is very common for this garnet to form in, right? Garnet loves to push other minerals out of the way, so often you will find these perfect little dodecahedrons, right? And we can see these kind of twinnings and stuff. I believe this is marcasite up here, right? Just these beautiful kind of expressions of the order in which those different atoms are arranged inside the mineral, right? Luster. Luster is how light is reflected from the surface of a mineral. And luster is important, right? So we're going to look at have something having a, a uh, you know, this is called a vitreous or glassy luster, right? This is a metallic luster, right? Really looks like a metal, like you could conduct, le conduct electricity through it, right? Uh, and then this piece of talc down here, I mean, you can see it even kind of looks like it has a greasy kind of feel to it, right? And indeed it would, right? That's where we get talcum powder. Right. Color. Uh, I will tell you commonly, color is an unreliable diagnostic tool because of impurities in the crystal structure and you know imperfect or imperfections in the crystal structure, impurities in there, right? Other little ions get in there a little bit, right? So for example, these are all examples of quartz down here, right? So we have clear quartz, we have amethyst, the purple, citrine, the the uh, orange, and then smoky quartz or black. So we have it all the way from, from crystal clear to pitch black, right? But all of these will still have this glassy vitreous luster, even this black stuff, if you look at it close, it's not, you know, um, uh, opaque, you can, it's transparent, you can see through it, right? But there are a few, a very few minerals that color is very diagnostic on. One of those is olivine. There's a saying, olivine is olive green, because it almost always is, right? A little bit more reliable uh, indicator of, of color uh, is streak, right? Now, this is, tells you the color of a powdered mineral, right? This can be more reliable as the you know, surface of the mineral may have undergone oxidation, right? Streak will help you out in certain circumstances, right? A streak plate's about a hardness of six, so if a mineral is harder than that, you won't get a streak from it. But certain other minerals, right, uh, have very diagnostic streaks. So this one here, right, uh, this is a mineral called hematite, right, and heme, hemoglobin, right, blood, blood red streak, that's where it gets its name from, right, so it leaves a streak, right, even though it's a silvery metallic, you know, uh, um, look to it, when you streak it on the streak plate, it leaves a reddish brown streak, right, which is very indicative of that hematite, right. And then here is the, the diagnostic property you're probably familiar with, right? The Mohs hardness scale, right? The hardness is a measure, basically, of the resistance of a mineral to, to being scratched or abraded, right? And it is a very useful diagnostic tool. It's one of the main ones we will be using, right? And, of course, we all know this because diamond is the hardest mineral on the planet, right? Now, does this mean you cannot break a diamond? Well, no, of course not. Of course you can break a diamond. How else would we cut them, right? Um, diamonds can be brittle, right? That's nothing to do with, with hardness, right? But it is the hardest substance we know, right? And they, we have them kind of ranked all the way from, from a one, you know, the softest, right? Gypsum, you can scratch with kind of your fingernail, right? Calcite can be scratched with a copper penny, right? Uh, potassium feldspar, right? A glass plate is a pocket knife or about five and a half. We'll be using a glass plate in our experiments uh, as kind of a major uh, indicator of, of what, you know, or a major clue as to what mineral it is, major property of that mineral, right? If it's harder than glass or softer than glass, right? But it's important to note that during each one of these jumps, it's a tenfold increase. So gypsum is 10 times harder than talc. Calcite is 100 times harder than talc. Fluoride is 1,000 times harder than talc, and so on and so on. All right. So 
Another very useful diagnostic property is called cleavage, right? And this is related to the internal order of those mineral or of those atoms and the arrangement of those inside the mineral structure, right? And what happens is uh, when we're doing cleavage, we're basically looking at giving the mineral some blunt force trauma, like with a hammer or something, and seeing how that energy vibrates through the crystal, right? If there are weak bonds in there, weak planes of bonding, those are going to preferentially break first, right? We can define cleavage as perfect to poor, right? Uh, and minerals can cleave in more than one different direction, right? So uh, another important thing to note, if it has more than one direction of cleavage, what are the angles of those directions of cleavage in relation to each other? Right? Let's take a look at this, right? So here are... Um, uh, an image of what we call biotite or, or muscovite. This is a, a sheet silicate. We'll talk about those in the next video here. Um, but this is basically, so here's our, our silicon and oxygen atoms. Silicon and oxygen atoms are very strongly bonded, right? Um, so those are going to be uh, in these kind of layers or sheets. And in between them, we have weak bonds, right? So longer bonds, weaker bonds, right? They're going to preferentially break between these sheets of silicates, right? They're going to preferentially break in these planes there, right? And then here's a piece of biotite mica, right? So you can see it cleaves into these flat planes, right? This is uh, also known as basal cleavage, right? Now there are a bunch of different types of cleavage we'll look into, right? The first of those is basal cleavage, right? And this is, for example, our mica minerals. So biotite mica, muscovite mica, chloride, a bunch of these, right? They have this what's called perfect basal cleavage, and you can peel them up into little sheets, theoretically down to, you know, one atomic layer thin, right? And again, our example there is biotite, breaks into these perfect flat sheets, right? Two directions of cleavage is known as prismatic cleavage, but it's important to differentiate are those at basically right angles or are they not at right angles to each other right so here we have prismatic cleavage at right angles to each other right two directions at right angles to each other right and this is going to create kind of you know obviously square kind of you know profile right like this piece of uh augite here right you can see this break here and here in an almost square pattern right that is prismatic, also called prismatic, right? But here we have, uh, again, not at right angles. So this would be more at like uh, 60 and 120 degree angle, right? Or 60 degree being in here, 120 degree being in here, right? So when you break this, instead of the side profile being like that, it's going to be like that, right? And an example here would be our, our amphibole horn blend here. You can see this kind of 60 and 120 degree angle. There's the 120 degree, right? There's the 60 degree angle. Right? So note those, those, those differences in angle between our two different types of prismatic cleavage. Right? Then we have two types of three directions of cleavage, right? So we can have three directions of cleavage, right? All perpendicular to each other, right? Mutually perpendicular, so all at right angles, right? And this is going to make cubes right you're going to see cubes and squares and stuff all through these these minerals right and our favorite example of this is our mineral halite right we've had you know table ordinary table salt sodium chloride it has this very cubic or square structure when you hit this with a hammer you'll break it into smaller and smaller squares and in fact uh you can even do this with the the table salt uh, in your in your uh, salt shaker, if you take it and break it up, you know, finer and finer and finer, it will theoretically break, you know, down, you know, to one atom thick uh, in these square shapes. And again, reflecting, you know, those weak bonds being in kind of, you know, mutually perpendicular directions. Right? If we have three directions of cleavage, but they're not mutually perpendicular, we call it rhombohedral, right? So it was a square, but tilted on its side, right? That's a rhombohedron, right? So here we have one, two, three directions of cleavage, right? Not at right angles. This is very uh, classic for a mineral known as calcite, right? Uh, very common mineral. 
Uh, and you can even see, look in here, you can see kind of these, these rhombohedral shapes reflected throughout the service. So if you're to hit this with a hammer, you get variations of these kind of tilted squares or ROMs. Right? Now the last one we'll look at is octahedral cleavage. This is four directions of cleavage, right? Let's look here. We have one here, two, if we go to the back, three, right, and four, right? One, two, three, four, right? And those are reflected. So this one here is the same as the one up here, right? They're in the same plane, right? These are in the same plane. I'll show you this a little bit better uh, when we get to the lab, right? But octahedral makes triangle shapes, as you can see, right? So if you see variations on triangles and octahedrons, which are these double pyramid type things, right? That is telling you you have four directions of cleavage, right? Uh, if a mineral doesn't have cleavage, it has fracture, and, and in directions where it doesn't have cleavage, it also has fracture, right? Uh, but some minerals only have fracture. Minerals such as quartz only have fracture, right? And that really is because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the silicon and the oxygen bonds are very strong. Quartz is almost entirely silicon and oxygen bonds, actually. It is entirely silicon and oxygen bonds. So there is no weak direction, no weak plane. So instead of, you know, preferentially breaking down these weak planes, it's going to kind of feather throughout the surface, right? This is what we know as conchoidal fracture. Another diagnostic uh, property that can be useful, uh, in some cases, most minerals are about, you know, two and a half to three density, right? But, uh, you know, though some of them are going to be quite a bit heavier. This one called Galena is about nine times as or seven times denser than uh, water. So you're going to have, you know, uh, a pretty good heft to it. So some of these, you pick them up and you're just kind of like, whoa, that, that feels heavier than it should be, right? So they have a higher density or higher specific gravity, right? Again, useful on some, but not many, right? Let's look at those uh, uh, those uh, um, specific gravity, right? Most rocks, two and a half to three. We found that out in the first lab, right? Uh, specific gravity, Galena, again, seven and a half. So pretty heavy. But how about gold, right? Gold has a density of 19.32. So almost 20 times denser than water. And if a, uh, a gallon of water weighs eight pounds, um, a gallon of gold would weigh... 160 pounds, but I bet you I could get it home. <laughs> a few other diagnostic properties uh, that help in very specific cases, taste, right? Now you don't want to go around licking all your minerals because there are some arsenic minerals out there, not in your kits, you're safe. But, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if you got a piece of halite, it's going to taste like salt, right? Uh, feel, like I mentioned, uh, you know, that, that uh, talc has a very greasy kind of feel to it. Some minerals are magnetic, right? Well, iron minerals can be magnetic. And some minerals, we'll look at a group called the carbonates, uh, react to dilute hydrochloric acid. They fizz in a, a chemical reaction when you put hydrochloric acid on them. All right, folks, we'll see you in the next video.